I feel really fortunate to be beginning my career in ag right now because of where we stand from an environmental standpoint and the public perception of agriculture. I think people are willing to to say, you know, there's enough information out there. Where people understand that we need to to make changes, right? Something to Chew On is a podcast devoted to the exploration and discussion of global food systems. It's produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University. I'm Maureen Olevnik, Coordinator of Global Food Systems. I'm Scott Tenona. I'm a philosopher of science. And I'm John Fabian. I'm a food scientist. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. At its core, a university exists to help students become aware of the world around them, understand the past, and learn to identify current and future questions and how to confront the challenges of their generation. Our guest today is Joseph J. Weeks, now Dr. Weeks. Jay became involved in the global food systems at K-State early in its reincarnation and well into his work toward completion of his Ph.D. The idea of using podcasts to help deliver information on those core university requirements in the area of the food systems was a cloudy notion in my mind when I first met Jay. His enthusiasm for this form of information sharing helped to develop the current platform, Something to Chew On. Jay worked with me, Scott Tenona, and John Fabian on the idea of bringing information on K-State food system related research to students, faculty, and to the world. Its current success is testimony to the university's ability to accomplish the goals of developing the next generation of leaders like Jay. Jay, as you moved on to your new job and new life, we hope for your continued input and direction from the perspective of a food systems professional. Congratulations. Now, let's hear a little bit about Jay, how he got here, how he completed this series of goals, and where he is headed. And I get to say this this time. So, Jay, welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. It's exciting to be in the in this seat for once. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Absolutely. Well, this is, this is a little bit of a bittersweet um, podcast for us because this is Jay's time that he's going to be taking off and, and moving on to another another part of his life. But um, congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And your job. And yeah, your absolutely. job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it's, uh, I'm sad to, to be leaving all of you, uh, but I'm excited for the next step as well. So. Yeah, very, excellent. Very, it's very the way exciting. things go. That's right. Yeah. Very exciting. Well, um, as our audience knows, um, Jay, you've been the one sitting in this spot for the last eight months, six, eight months. Um, and uh, this was pretty much your brainchild in, in, <laughs> in putting this podcast system together. And um, I really appreciate all the work you've done on it. It's been, it's been a real journey for us so far, and it's been quite a success. And so we're really excited about it. And um, I guess we'll just take the same tack that we do with the other presenters. <laughs> Tell us a taste of my own medicine. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, a little bit about my background. Well, if I go all the way back, uh, my interest in, in food uh, sort of stems from the fact that my grandparents uh, owned a small dairy farm in central New York. Uh, so growing up, uh, you know, my grandmother uh, watched me when I was really young. Uh, and so I became familiar with, you know, being around the farm and all that. And when I finally was old enough, I got to participate in farm activities. Uh, and I thought that that was really cool. Uh, so I spent uh, school breaks and and summers and things like that uh, on the farm all the way up through my undergrad actually um, and I wanted to uh, run the farm when I was done uh, I wasn't even planning on going to college although my mother especially thought differently and said no you're going to college and if you decide to do something different afterwards then that's fine uh, but I want you to have that so I decided to pursue a degree in agricultural sciences uh, at Cornell University uh, and I didn't know what I didn't know, which is a kind of a running theme in, in my life, and that uh, fell in love with soils uh, and found out I really liked chemistry, uh, which I, I didn't know before. 
uh, and found that I could marry soils and chemistry uh, and use that, you know, those passions to to make progress in, in other parts of the world. Um, I had a professor who was doing research on lead contaminated soils. So I became interested in the, in the pollution components of that. Uh, so I decided that for graduate school, I wanted to do research in, in lead contaminated soils and try to protect people uh, from those soils and that are when they're trying to grow fruits and vegetables and that sort of thing, especially in inner cities. Um, so I met the professor I worked here at K-State, Dr. Ganga Hedarachi, at uh, a soil conference in San Antonio. Uh, you know, she we hit it off right away, and, you know, here I was. Uh, that's how I got started. Excellent. So, so that's your background. Yeah, yeah, that's my background. What about your foreground? What's... Uh, What's well, what's up next? So uh, I started off with the with the soil lead stuff, um, but I you know after a couple of years of that realized that I really was more interested in soil fertility, uh, and I realized that there was probably a greater chance to make a, a global impact working in soil phosphorus than in necessarily working in soil lead, although both are very important for for different reasons. Um, so I started pursuing. Uh, research related to imp improving the use efficiency of of soil phosphorus fertilizers uh, and trying to understand the chemical mechanisms there and, and how we could improve farming practices and make better fertilizers. Um, so I pursued that uh, for most of my PhD research. Uh, and then, you know, again, I started seeing that there are other options out there besides just working in soil phosphorus and that it's not just limited to you know, you, none of these things operate in a vacuum, right? You know, soil phosphorus interacts with the carbon, and, I've, you know, so I became more interested in carbon cycling and things like that. Uh, so this opportunity came along at a company that's relatively new called Indigo Egg, uh, where they are trying to build a, one of the things that they're trying to do amongst many uh, is that they're trying to build a carbon market where they actually pay farmers to implement practices that build carbon in their soil. So they can sequester carbon as a, as not only a means to improve soil health, uh, but also reverse climate change, right? Uh, and because not because those practices initially aren't always profitable for the farmer, especially at the beginning sometimes, uh, by paying farmers to sequester this carbon, it sort of makes that process roll. Uh, so I'll be working as a soil scientist there, helping to move some of their uh, work from their R&D department into into commercial uh, commercial products and things like that. And this is in bucolic rural Boston. This is <laughs> yeah, this, they're based out of Charleston, Boston. <laughs> Excellent. So, could you? How much of that is is about like the economics, right? Uh, and how much is it about sort of the science? So, w what kinds of things are they developing that you can say? I mean, and talk about right? Uh, and and what kinds of what they're doing? You said they have to. You know, incentivize farmers for doing things too. So, like, what's going on there? I mean, I don't know how much you can say about what they're actually up to, but yeah, I mean, because I, I'm still a, yeah, a little bit out from right, starting, yeah, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to overstep yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and overstate yeah, what they're course. doing. Um, <laughs> but you know, we really we, we, scientifically we know that there are ways to to build the carbon stores in the soil, uh, and that it's beneficial for for soil health because it improves nutrient cycling. Uh, improves water holding capacity, makes makes the soils more drought resistant if you're growing crops in them and that sort of stuff. Um, but there are there can be financial barriers to you know to growing a cover crop um, for a variety of reasons. Some of it is just the, the cost of growing it uh, and terminating it and things like that. Um, so I really think that I I personally believe more in in market based solutions to problems, and I think that if we're going to come up with ways to mitigate climate change or actually start to reverse some of the effects of of carbon emissions, uh, that we really need to find financial incentives. Because although there will always be people who adopt these practices for the good of the environment or find that it's beneficial on their own farm and things like that, I really find that if if we can build functioning markets that pay people and incentivize people to implement these practices. And they get the added benefit uh, on the f in the field too. Then it's a win-win for everybody uh, in that case, and it's not just relying on the farmer to do what's right because it's necessarily what's right. Even though in the long run, it probably would benefit them anyway. Do you think this is transportable successfully outside the limits of the U.S.? Is this a model or an idea that that would work in Africa, for example? 
Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. I mean as long as as long as there's a functioning carbon market, okay. right? So as long as there's people putting money into that market to pay for these practices, uh, which sort of depends on you know the political process and, right. and, and what the consumers who are buying the products that the companies are paying for the carbon offsets uh, are for. Uh, as long as that sort of process exists, then yeah, I think it could be trans- you know it could work anywhere. It clearly sounds to be a, a mid-range to semi-long range solution. As well, if at least unless I'm if I'm understanding it correctly, this is something we're not going to see large quantitative differences in right away. Well, no, I mean, what, what the the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now is something like 415, 420 parts per million, right? You know, if we if we implement this in in five years, it's not going to all of a sudden be back down. No, to, no, 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 no. Three hundred, no, right? I, yeah, what I was going to do was was make an inequality between that rate of change and the rate rate of change in politics. You could find yourself on the wrong sure. side of the, <laughs> of, the, of the political balance, and then you'd it'd be all up. Well, yeah, I mean, that's why, again, I think it's it's important to build markets around this sort of stuff that, that can be resilient to, to at least some of those whims of, of the politics, right? Um, you know, if we, we, as we've seen in the last few years, the, the politics can be pretty capricious, and, you know, what gets implemented by one administration can easily be redacted by the next. Uh, so if we build something that... that you know the the public or that the private sector believes in and that farmers buy into, then that can operate independently of uh, you know then of what the government's doing. Ideally, although you know the government will always have some influence on it, I'm sure. Yeah. So what's the idea with the carbon market? So this is people paying for offsets. Is this is the idea generally? Um, you know, I actually don't know that much about what people are proposing here. Is it? But is the idea is generally that governments are going to be paying right for these offsets, or that other other people who are using right emitting a lot are going to be paying so it's just sort of it's just between consu- producers right or, yeah or if it's my understanding that uh, at this point I, yeah. i'm not 100 percent certain but uh, it's my understanding that the government won't be paying necessarily for the offsets that it's it's going to be the the companies doing the right. emitting right right because they want to be able to say that they're carbon neutral or or even carbon negative because now with with increased public awareness that there there's a there's possibly a market for that right people will right. pay a little bit more to know that or to right. have the idea that their products are are not or are more sustainable right than, mm-hmm. so yeah so this and and again this isn't about the company in particular just sort of about the idea right so then so then we have the potential to sort of you've got the potential to mitigate, right? So all right, you know, people do this personally too, right? So if I'm gonna take a flight somewhere, right, how do I offset, right, my 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 carbon footprint there, right? And I right. do something else or I pay into something that, you know, does something good, uh, plant some trees or something like that, right? Uh now, you know, generally that's not gonna that might mitigate your impact right it's not reversing it by itself right and then i think that's one of the that's one of the big challenges with that is it might slow down right the rates of increases right but um and so one amongst many things to be doing sure right you know sure yeah, i mean i don't i don't believe right? yeah. it necessarily no, i know the, i know, you know this i'm not situation. i'm not picking on you yeah, or the yeah, company yeah, yeah. either right but i sort of yeah i mean all these ideas are it's hard well, yeah. and you mentioned that you mentioned the offsetting your flights sort yeah. of thing. I know there are companies who have tried to yeah. set up personal kiosks yes. in the airports yeah. where you yes. pay X amount of dollars for every mile you're you're yeah. going to fly or whatever. And from my understanding, is those actually weren't that successful yeah. because it was sort of confusing to the consumer. Yeah. Um, but it's actually, from what I understand, a lot of the airlines have signed on to an agreement where they actually are purchasing offsets to some degree mm. as part of an international agreement. Uh, so. I think that it's that, right? That it's you know whether it be American Airlines or Delta or somebody who really commits to buying those offset credits. That that's really what's going to build mm-hmm. the market. And if we can get more companies on board doing that sort of thing, uh, and people vote with their dollars to support right. companies that do that, then that's a that's a better way to do it. Than and then and then we need more ways of actually sequestering carbon. So then we yeah, yeah right yeah. But that are mutually beneficial, right? right? Yeah, I mean, true, right. What's great yeah. about what I'm hoping to participate in is that this is beneficial for farmers anyway. Right. Uh, right. So it's, you know, it's sort of a win-win for right. them. Right. Cool. Okay. Well, taking it back to um, kind of your time moving through the university setting, how you you worked, you identified a major professor that you wanted to work with and, and, and went through and worked through that. Who else did you have as mentors kind of working with you on the way through that that piece of it? 
Uh, well, I mean, there's been, yeah, yes, I've been thinking back. I've been getting nostalgic yeah. uh, mm-hmm. in my, in my yes. last few yeah. weeks here. But the, there's been a lot of people who have who've had a really positive impact uh, on, on not only my, my career, but also my, uh, you know, my personal development as well. I mean, you, Maureen, uh, have had a, had a tremendous impact uh, giving me this opportunity uh, and just getting to know you better over time. And you and it's Scott and John as well. It's been great to, to get to know everybody. Uh, but my graduate committee uh, has been has been really influential uh, in helping me to, to identify what my uh, research priorities are and ways of thinking about my research uh, that I might not have considered, right? It's really important, and I think, you know, in my experience, this isn't even done enough, that we need to have other people, outside voices, challenging what we're doing in research uh, so that we get uh, outside perspectives and we don't get too siloed in, in what we the mental models we build of, of the impact that we're, of the things that we're doing uh, that are maybe absent from the real world. Right? Mm-hmm. So constantly asking those questions. So that's been really influential. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, my friends out at Piccolilly Farm have, had a <laughs> mm-hmm. have been immensely uh, influential. Nat and Allison have been great and really uh, have been a significant influence on my life. Um, but you know, other things that have been Im- immensely uh, influential have been podcasts. To be honest with you, <laughs> what got me into doing all of this to begin with is a couple of years ago, uh, a friend of mine uh, just sent me a couple of podcasts that were like three hours long a piece. He's like, oh, I think this is really oh interesting. You would be, uh, you know, I think you'd find this fascinating. And I was like, three hours? Who's got, <laughs> who's got time? To, I remember to having listen? that talk with you. <laughs> yeah. Like, who's got time to listen to this? Uh, but I, you know, I eventually, you know, in the car and things, worked through a couple of them. I was like, "Wow, this is crazy!" And that sort of opened up my my mind to a lot of different possibilities uh, and what people are talking about. Uh, and it's helped me frame my research a little differently too, because you get outside perspectives from from different scientists. You know, I listen to physicists, I listen to philosophers and psychologists and all that kind of stuff. And it really helps me build a more uh, interdisciplinary uh, understanding of, of of the problems that we have in society, uh, and how science is, is one part. You know, technological solutions are one part to those solu- to those to solving those problems. Um, but there, as we've talked about in previous episodes, that it's it's only one component, right? Uh, you know, it has to work politically, it has to work socially, uh, and it has to work to scale and all that kind of stuff. So, I, I mean, there's been a lot of different influences. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing missing people and things in there, but. Uh, yeah. I've what been about very grateful the, for the opportunity. What about the rigor of working on a dairy farm as a as a as a means to <laughs> focus you? I, I that's sure. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely something to be said for growing up uh, <clears throat> in an agricultural family. Uh, you know, my my grandfather, well, on both grandfathers on both sides, and my grandmothers too. Uh, you know, we're we're constantly working uh, seven days a week. You know, from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun comes down. Yes, uh, and that's just the way life was. Uh, you can't stop the cows, no matter you what. Can't, you can't stop the cows. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, so yeah, I think it was enormously influential. Although you know, I've changed my my thinking about you know hard work uh, a little bit uh, over time. I think. You know, staying focused and working hard is is really important. But I also think that, you know, always grinding it out and always doing the same thing because that's what needs to be done is maybe not the not always what you should be doing. Sometimes you need to take a step back, uh, and and say, you know, is what I'm doing still working for me in the capacity that I need it to, and where do I need to make those changes? Uh, and I think sometimes if you're always focused, and this happens in grad school too, you know, you got to get this project done, you got to get this project done, you got to focus on publishing this paper, you lose sight of of the whole thing. Uh, so, you know, especially as I've gotten later into my in my degree process, I've sort of slowed down a little bit, which you know isn't isn't always advisable, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and reevaluated, uh, mm-hmm. and that's and that's actually part of what turned me into going into the commercial sector for a job versus academia. I think academia has a lot of positive things, but thinking about my own personal goals uh, and where I wanted to to focus my my efforts, you know, it's not for everybody, but that's you know, by taking that step back is I think important. So in the um in in the process of working through you you went through and talked about some of the mentors that you had and people that that influenced you how wh- what kind of interaction with students had a very positive or negative i mean how how did that interaction work as you were working through your your programs 
Uh, yeah, so I've had a lot of different interactions with students, both uh, graduate students, fellow graduate students that I've been working with. Uh, I had some that uh, really helped me get started, uh, and I, as I got older, I began to appreciate how much they helped me uh, you know, get off and running and how important it is to have older graduate students and postdocs in the lab uh, so that you can sort of, they can help you speed along your development. You know, this is where you need to go to do this, and this is how you accomplish this, and uh, I was much further along because, uh, you know, people like Philip were, uh, you know, helped me uh, get started in my research. Uh, so there's definitely that aspect. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with students in other departments, uh, which has been good, uh, you know, learning how different research groups do different things and how geology looks at soils very differently than soil chemistry in the agronomy department looks at soils. So it's helped me build that perspective as well, working across departments. Um, I taught, I was a, a teaching assistant for six semesters here uh, and two semesters at Cornell. Uh, so I was able to, to interact with a wide array of uh, undergraduates uh, and that was, that was interesting as well. Uh, I learned a lot about how people learn uh, and I learned a lot about how, you know, what makes sense to me because of the way I learn doesn't necessarily make sense to, to other people. Uh, in a, one of the most striking things was, was mindset and how important some of that stuff is. And I hate to sound cliche, you know, saying that there's a difference between a growth and a limited mindset, but it really makes a difference in, in some of those undergraduate students. Uh, I had a really bright girl once, uh, she was, she missed class. She was on a field trip or something like that. And, she said to me, she's like, hey, you know, I really enjoy what we're doing in lab these days and I want to teach eventually, but I'm afraid uh, that I won't have enough smart kids to do some of these things. And I was like, what, what do you mean you're afraid you won't have enough smart kids? And she's like, well, I'm not sure that everybody's going to get it. And I'm like, well, everybody can get it, you know, eventually. Just we got to, you know, think about how to do this differently. And she was, uh, she was really shocked. She'd really thought that there was this dichotomy, that there were some kids that were going to get it and there were some kids that – that weren't. And never the twain shall meet, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that made me think, well, you know, she didn't come up with this out of nowhere, right? Somebody had taught this to her, whether it be, uh, you know, I don't know, it could be parents, it could be her own educational experience, but it was coming from somewhere. Uh, and that really makes it, you know, that matters. So it makes me wonder sometimes with, with students that are struggling if it's, it's a framing issue in some ways. Uh, so my, you know, my interaction with students has been, has been diverse and it's been different depending on, you know, kind of where they're at along their, their educational process, but there's always something to be learned for sure. So we've talked a little bit about where you've come from and, and where you're heading to in the process of starting into your graduate work and from that point till the, till Till now, have your impressions or thoughts about what agriculture is about changed? I mean, you came out of a you came out of a situation where you were working on a farm and and had all kinds of notions of what that was about. Even thought about taking over that farm. Sure. And you're you're heading down a path that's <laughs> totally different from it's agriculture, but it's totally different. Have do you think about agriculture in a different light, or do, are your opinions on what it's about have they changed? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as I've gotten older, not only just about in agriculture specifically, but I find that a lot of things tend to be on a spectrum that, you know, a lot of things that are presented to us as, as you know, in these individual silos, whether it be from the agricultural standpoint, conventional ag versus organic ag or sustainable ag or small ag versus big ag and all that kind of stuff is that, is that the, you know, none of those fit neatly within little boxes. And when I, when I started, uh, I definitely sort of had that mentality, right? I mean, we were a, we were a small pastured uh, dairy. Uh, we were trying to do things as environmentally friendly as possible and, you know, supported the ag or the organic movement uh, to some extent. Uh, and I kind of grew up with this idea that, you know, the big commercial ag wasn't, wasn't always the best, right? Uh, but, you know, I, my perspective has definitely changed on that. There, there can be very good... Uh, very environmentally friendly, very successful, very big farms. And there can be very small farms that do things that are horrible for the environment, right? 
and there's there's organic that's you know is very careful to you know recycle all of their nutrients and all that kind of stuff and there can be organic that is even worse than some of those really big conventional farms none of this you know we it's easy because i think mentally we like to put things in little boxes because it's easier to think about rather than everything fluctuating um, but we really have to identify ag on an individual farm basis and what what works well in one region or what works well on one farm doesn't isn't going to work on another and there, there isn't a simple prescription to what makes farming environmentally friendly or productive or or even financially sustainable uh, that we really need to to consider all of the options uh, that are on the table and make the best choice individually do you think there are particular issues with scale sort of doing things on the large size i mean sort of like you just said sort of there can be huge farms that that do things better in some ways right uh is the risk to the environment though from a small farm even if they're like really being bad right sort of the impact is smaller right i how much do you think that's a factor to really worry about well it depends on what they're doing yeah right uh you know if that small farm is in the you know at the uh, beginning of a tributary that flows into a a large reservoir that New York City uses for its uh, drinking water, that could be, you know, hugely detrimental. Whereas a farmer out in Western Kansas that you know, maybe doesn't have X, you know, that's maybe pumping groundwater for irrigation, but does things as sustainable as possible, is building the carbon in their soil, uh, is drought resilient and all that, might not have anywhere near the environmental impact. It's tough to, to quantify that. Plus, you know, it depends on what your what you're quantifying. Are you quantifying water usage? Are you quantifying use of... Uh, you know, certain fertilizers, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are so many variables. Yeah, this is this is super important. I think we keep, we've talked about this too a bunch of times here, right? and I think it's important to keep on emphasizing that. Right? There's no there's no one dimension, right? right? You know, there's so many different things, and sometimes you try you do better on one dimension, and sort of it makes it harder to do better on this other one, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's it's important for people to acknowledge that, right? I mean, there's always going to be trade-offs with things in one way or another. You know, if you want... Uh, if you want food that's that's produced in ways that you know maybe are better for the environment, well, it's probably going to cost more in the in the grocery store, right? Uh, that's the, the crazy thing about the commodification of a lot of grain crops is that it's a race to the bottom. You know, the more you produce, the more the price goes down. So then the farmer makes less. So then then they have less money to implement those practices. Uh, you know, I think you know, going back briefly to the carbon market thing, I think that's the nice thing about that is this actually is a secondary source of income for farmers to. Uh, to get paid to do those sorts of practices that's independent of their yield. Uh, and I think that that's really important. Yeah, that sounds really promising. Yeah. It really does. Do you get much pushback when you, when <laughs> I you always stand get up? Back. <laughs> well, has, uh, has, has the type or the amount of it changed over the course of, say, three years, four years? In my own personal opinions on things? or, or Well, I'll, you, either one. You know, when, when you're talking about this, you know, uh, somebody puts up their hand and goes nonsense or you know, <laughs> some other. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes people push back on things. I always welcome criticism. I think that's the only way that you can, mm -hmm. you know, really make sure that what you're saying is, <coughs> is true and holds up to, to debate, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So anybody out there that wants to review anything I say, please let, please leave a review on iTunes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I, you know, it's interesting. It's an, it's a fascinating time to be in agriculture. I was just having this conversation with my roommate the other day. Uh, I feel really fortunate to be beginning my career in ag right now because of where we stand from an environmental standpoint and the public perception of agriculture. I think people are willing to, to say, you know, there's enough information out there. Where people understand that we need to, to make changes, right? Uh, and technologically, the sky is the limit right now. Uh, it's just, you know, it's what, what incentive structures uh, are we going to put into place uh, that allows some of these things to, to flourish or, or not? Uh, so it's, it's great to, to be thinking about you know, what the food system could look like even 10 years from now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's pushback, but I think people are becoming more and more open-minded, especially as, you know, I don't think a lot of people in the past have had a lot of, ex we kind of went through this dip, right? I mean, there were people who came from, there was a lot of people a while ago that had some relation to farms in their family, right? But as farms have consolidated and the small farms have, have gone away to some extent, fewer and fewer people in the 
the greater population have any connection to the farms in general. But that slowly, that trough is slowly building again. People are now paying more attention to you know what they're eating, where their food is coming from. Uh, so that sort of opened up uh, a lot of space to start talking about how could we be doing things differently, and you know some people might be willing to pay a little bit more for for those kinds of things. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think there's less pushback now than there was there would have been ten years ago. Oh yes. yes. Yeah, and 10 years ago, it was still very much an argument about whether or not this was a way of life that had limits to which you wanted to or should allow change. Sure. So you, you, you ran up against those walls in any discussion, and, and that's changed substantially. Yeah, and I think that there's a, a lot more willingness to compromise around – Things like, you know, whether it be genetically engineered crops, uh, is, is using those things as, as a t- one tool in the toolbox uh, of, of many different options, as opposed to it being, you know, either you're going to be organic or, you know, you're going to be a, an agrochemical user, right? You know, it's a much more hybrid uh, use of some of these tools. So you, uh, while you're doing all your studies here, you've spent time on a farm here too, right? So uh, could you say something about how that, like, how that worked, like the, you know, keeping, keeping connected to actually, you know, being on the farm and doing that work. But now, you know, you're going, you're going to Boston, right? Sort of, are you going to, are you going to miss all this too? Like, what did it mean to you while you were here? And then, you know, how's that going to be going forward? Are you going to still try to try to find some connection to the land like that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, my position is going to be something like 50% travel. So mm-hmm. I'm still going to be visiting a lot of farms around the country to make sure that what we're, what we're proposing is, is working in the field. Mm-hmm. Right? It's important to really have that, that connection to the farmers. Mm-hmm. I can't just, you know, if farmers like nothing less than somebody standing in yeah. a big city being like, you should do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm but, from Boston and I'm here to help. I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah, That's right. I mean, my, my future boss uh, said that he's even had uh, uh, farmers say, you know, oh, you're one of those guys that works from a stand up desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, Double that, that's, that's uh, you know, that's not the goal. At yeah. all. It's mm-hmm. really important to stay to stay connected to the land because. You know, farmer, farmers are doing what they're doing for a reason, uh, and it's important to understand how you know if we're if we're proposing any changes that uh, that works within within their model. Um, but from my own personal standpoint, yeah, I've been working with Piccadilly Farm for you know five five years now or so, uh, and it's been great just because of the camaraderie. Uh, I love Nat and Allison and now their their daughter Mary uh, a lot, so it's been great to have that connection. But uh, I believe in that physical labor is is a really important component to a healthy life. Uh, I think that the the research out there uh, shows pretty conclusively that getting exercise is good for your your mental state uh, and your emotional state and all of that. So it, it's been beneficial there. But yeah, I mean, I didn't have much experience with vegetable farming uh, and growing things like you know pea shoots and sunflower shoots in a greenhouse. So it's been a, it's been a really great experience. Uh, to learn all of that sort of stuff too, uh, you know, Nat and Allison really opened up my eyes to a lot of different uh, practices that I wouldn't have been familiar with before. Um, also, you know, it's given me a different appreciation for uh, the use of food on, you know, as something you eat. Uh, you know, they're they're great cooks, and they're you know they're interested in using things like you know a sunflower shoot in a in a dish, which is something that I wouldn't have ever had experience with. Uh, before, or even, you know, eating different cheeses, fresh chev and that kind of stuff is just something that I didn't have a lot of exposure to. So, yeah, I mean, having a diverse array of experiences with different kinds of farms, is, it's always good to get more experience no matter what you're doing. You know, the more you, you, more you interact with people who are, you know, tangentially related but are doing things differently, the more you're going to understand that, uh, that everybody's human and everybody has their own needs and priorities and that, uh, you know, people are doing what they're doing because for a reason. Um, one of the things that I know that you are really good at as well is mixing wonderful cocktails. <laughs> I mixed a cocktail or two. You have life. mixed a cocktail or two. And I have <laughs> I've mixed a this. cocktail or two. Um, so or two. <laughs> there's a lot of chemistry involved in that. There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of artistic thought that goes into it. How, sure. I mean, where, where, where did that come into your life? 
Well, yeah, you know, I, I often bartending, I got a lot of people asking me, you know, whether or not I use much of my chemistry knowledge to, to make better cocktails. And, and the sad answer is no, not really. <laughs> uh, you know, I understand uh, some of it, you know, that like ethanol is a great, you know, agent for you for extracting certain, certain flavors and that sort of thing. Uh, but honestly, you know, I liked bartending because it was a break uh, from some of that kind of stuff. And it allowed me to explore the artistic side of food. Uh, a little bit more. I mean, I think uh, cocktails are absolutely beautiful. You can take, you know, three or four different ingredients that you might not think go together uh, and they can just be in the right proportions. And if you shake them just enough or stir them just enough or you garnish them just right, uh, that, it, you know, it can transform into something completely different. Uh, and and I love that. And I love sharing that with people. You know, it's it's great when I have somebody who's like, oh, you know, I, I like to drink gin and tonics or something like that uh so you're like well let, let me show you this gin cocktail that, you know you would have never never had an experience with before uh and they're just blown away by it uh and, and i think that that's great it's it's a fun social thing um and also you know honestly bartending helps me become a little more social uh it helped me talk to, to strangers a little bit better it helped me with my yeah, I guess you all listening will be the judge of that. But help me with my podcasting too, being able to have a conversation with people that you might not necessarily know. Uh, so yeah, there, I mean, there's all kinds of interactions there. But I'm not saying that everybody should should go into the bartending business. But uh, it's not, you know, it, it, it can be an immensely beneficial uh, experience. Well, and that is kind of a segue into some of the discussion we 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 thought about heading into on in the area of podcasting. Um, as I started this out today, um, I mentioned that this was really your your brainchild. This was your baby as we put it together. And when you came to me and said we should we should try podcasting, and you said an hour long, I had the same reaction you did with your friend giving you a three hour long podcast, thinking no one's going to listen to an hour long podcast. And um, we've both seen really great response to what's been happening here, which is is encouraging, but just uh, really fulfilling to see that there are a lot of people that are interested in understanding what the faculty members on this campus are doing. So, um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about how you got into the podcast. What were your thoughts about this particular one when we got it going? Well, I mean, podcasts as a media have been around now for, I don't know, uh, a little over a decade. Uh, and like I said, I just got into them a couple of years ago. Uh, what I, but I mean, they're rapidly growing here in the last few years. And I, I think the reason for that is that people are starving for nuanced conversation on some of these big issues. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been pretty critical of the, of the media, uh, you know, some deserve and some not, but I, you know, I think what draws a lot of people to podcasts that are an hour long is that, uh, or is it a couple of things, you know, one, there can be a lot of podcasts on, on, they can be produced cheaply and pretty, you know, pretty easily uh, on topics that there just isn't enough of a market for otherwise, right? Uh, you know, some of the topics we cover are more popular with the public and some of them maybe not necessarily as much. Uh, but nobody's going to go out there and, you know, spend, you know, $50,000 to make a, an hour episode about one of the things that we're talking about, right? Uh, so this is a really great way for people to explore all different aspects of of life that uh, don't always get a microphone, you know, because the barrier of entry is, is so low. So it's really great in that respect. Uh, and, you know, again, like I said, the, the nuance we can spend, uh, we can spend an hour discussing, you know, the, uh, you know, why it's important to, to consider, you know, certain, uh, you know, whether we should be eating fats or sugars or something like that, right? Uh, or you know any of the topics that we've covered. Uh, we haven't published this yet, but the the Linda Duke one talking about the the art and the aesthetics of food. Uh, you know there are people out there who are interested in that sort of thing. Uh, but you know how often would would we be able to broadcast you know a Linda Duke to to all these people who don't necessarily have access to it? So uh, I just think it's a really great media for exploring ideas and and learning more about about life. I'm always fascinated by, by the world. So, <laughs> Tremendous irony to this in that back in the 50s at the start of the television age, it was not uncommon to have half hour or even hour long talk shows where people would discuss particular ideas. They tended to get broadcast generally on Sunday mornings, but you had a chance to engage not one-on-one -on -one, but at least be exposed to those ideas and those opinions. And that sort of went away. 
and it's good to see it come back in podcast form. Yeah, I mean, like I said, people are. I think people are starving for for more detailed discussions of of some of these issues and ideas. Uh, and it's and it, you know, people are so busy too that podcasts are great because you can listen to them whether you're at the gym or if you're on a commute or you know whether you're cooking dinner or something like that. I can consume podcasts in a variety of ways that I can't read a book. Uh, and I think that's another reason why they're becoming more and more popular. Yeah, and that's the, that's yeah. maybe a, a sad commentary on sort of why they're popular, right? Sort <laughs> yes, of, but I, but so. I do think it's true. So lots of people have long commutes, right? <laughs> and what else are you going to do, right? Uh, but but I love that podcasts have have filled in some of that. Uh, I, I I also think people are really looking for community too. So it's not just ideas. I think that's another thing that podcasts provide a lot of, right? Is this feeling of right that conversation and there's these people talking and you're entering into you know, entering into, you know, somebody else's world in some conversation, right? And I mean, a lot of them aren't very idea focused, right? Some of them are idea focused about content and some of them are just like friends chatting over dinner kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? And then some of them are funny and some of them, are, yeah. So I, it's it's amazing the diversity of stuff that's out there. And I love that we were able to provide one little, you know, niche, right? It's pretty cool. It really is. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. And I think you're right that there is a community aspect. I know I listen to to podcasts where I sort of identify with some of the people who yeah. are who are, you know, the hosts. Oh yeah, there, right? Uh, and it makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could you could imagine some of these people is, you know, palling around and having a beer with them or there something you go, right? like that. That's right? our goal, right? Yeah. It's sort of what we want out of this one, right? right. <laughs> uh yeah it's it's great and and like you said you know it is sort of sad that you know people have these situations where they you know have the opportunity to have hear podcasts instead of reading a book or whatever but they're gonna have those anyway you know so i'd yeah, rather it be filled absolutely. with you know more substantive content uh than it being filled with with something else yeah i mean it's it's amazing the podcast world is amazing it really is cool i'm i'm really glad you kicked this thing off so so tell us more about like yeah i don't know the process and how you felt going through it starting it and seeing it actually successful right? well it's yeah i mean it's pretty cool because uh you know i had actually talked to a couple of people about having the idea to explore more food related ideas uh in a podcast setting that was an informal conversation sort of thing uh about i don't know probably six months to a year prior to uh teaming up with maureen here uh and when she mentioned that there was they were thinking about doing a podcast i you know it just happened to be a really great coincidence and uh, you know so uh, we were able to to kick it off i mean i i was just curious to see whether or not i could do it right it's fun to have those sorts of challenges uh and i you know i guess i would like to to some extent turn it back around to to you guys what's it been like and we can make this a little more of a discussion what's it been like for you guys to be involved you know i know that you were a little excited but a little skeptical when i came to you at first (laughs) saying hey you know is this something you'd be interested i was definitely skeptical sort of not about the idea but about sort of how how much i would be comfortable in this role right because uh i think that this is something that we probably haven't ever talked about uh in the podcast but we talk about it a lot outside of it right when we're talking um you know a bunch of us are academics both our both our guests and you know people who are hosting here right uh and our the way we do things is really different right sort of when you when you talk it's you know it's in front of a classroom or it's uh or it's a presentation of research or you know uh you know, working with colleagues one on one, and those are all very different kinds of you know interactions, and 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 plenty of us do things sort of out in the public, but it's still there's still something very different about being recorded live, <laughs> right? And every little thing that you say that sure. might just go a little wrong, right? And you know about you know how, I, so I was worried about how prepped I would have to be, right? Sort of how um, how much I would need to know. Don't want to say something ridiculously stupid right <laughs> you know so yeah so this was a challenge so it's uh but i but i'm but i love podcasts too right i don't listen to enough of them because luckily i have a very short commute um and on a bike so it's not a good Definitely. place to listen to a podcast <laughs> right uh yeah. but uh um and and i'm committed to the idea of communicating right uh, and and to the idea to the idea of getting ideas out right so so I jumped in, I guess, right? You know, um, and it's been it's been great. It's been surprisingly not too bad. And I don't know. I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I I'm sure I could be much absolute amb- you know, amb- better. And, no, it's like it's been great. But um, there's a weird weird yeah. vulnerability you yeah. feel when you're like you're having your conversation being recorded, yeah. right? It's like you know, oh, it's it's as as it was alluded to earlier. We to some extent, even though we cl- might claim we 
we aren't, we generally know where we're going with a lecture or with a yeah. presentation. So we've got the confidence of that that knowledge net down there in case something goes wrong. Here, it's wherever it goes. You know, it's a random walk through science, and you have to be ready to flex your head and respond. Well, and I think that that's why it appeals to so many people in this format is that it's more conversational, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's more like you're sitting around a table talking with people as opposed to, you know, the, the quote-unquote sage on the stage or whatever that's just <laughs> uh, sort of telling you what you should know. Right. Uh, it's more, you know, these people, we're, we're all just people exploring ideas. and yeah, The idea is that it's a threat-free environment, I think, sure. makes a big difference as well. I'm, you know, I'm not going to stand up and beat Marina Hopefully over the head with the Hopefully microphone because I disagree with her. Yeah. No, it's been it's been really a good experience. <laughs> I, can't reach I have thing. not gotten directly involved in doing the podcast until just recently, and um, have have enjoyed what I've done so far. But the the whole idea, as you said, when um, you and I first talked about this, I was thinking about doing a podcast, but I was thinking fifteen minutes. You know, something very short, just little clips on what faculty are doing on campus, and I'm. Um, really glad you talked me into the hour approach to it because um, it's being picked up all over the world, which just shocked me. Um, people in in many parts of the world are interested in what we're doing here. And um, it's giving a little bit of voice to some of the research that's being done here that, you know, that may not may not get out in, in anything other than a peer-reviewed journal or something like that, where you've got a small handful of people that would read it. So it's, it's, it's been a great journey for me. It's been very, very interesting, and hopefully um, we'll be, we're going to be able to keep that going. Yes. No, I'm sure you guys will do great. I look forward to, to listening to some more in the future as uh, after I move away and you guys continue with all this. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you bring up another good point as far as podcasts in general. Is it's, it's Not only is it a low barrier to entry to make the podcast, but it's also pretty easy for people to access them all over the world, right? People who might not necessarily have access to other means of, of educational materials. Uh, you know, it can be downloaded uh, in any country, anywhere, and they're there for, you know, as long as the internet's alive, right? So, which, yeah, may be good or may be bad. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think a little bit about, like, internet archaeology and stuff, right? It's like stuff that you can find from you know, 15 years ago that's that's still there but it's out of oh, date yeah. now oh, yeah. we think differently or the public perception is differently you know there'll be a huge graveyard of podcasts uh, just available somewhere which is waiting kind of, to be mined for well yeah but well, there's will so many of them too though this is the thing <laughs> yeah, right sure. so that there's just so much out there it's kind of yeah it's kind of crazy to mind really the, next week we're putting on a big data time. workshop this is going to be one area of big data as we move forward it's uh, lots and lots and lots of information of sitting out there yeah yeah. Jay, what was your most surprising thing that happened in a podcast? Uh, one of our, one of the ones that we had here. Or, you know, something that you just weren't expecting or something that you learned or, 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 I, you know, I, I don't know. Well, I, it's funny. And I think Maureen and I have talked about this a little bit is, uh, I think this is true of, of everybody is that, uh, or most people at least, is people love to talk about themselves, right? You know, we, <laughs> yes. we, we thought at the beginning of this that sometimes it would be challenging to get a uh, faculty member or something to talk for an hour about what they're doing, but it hasn't oh, been, it hasn't been a challenge at all. But, but think about day-to-day life. When do you, besides us being in this room, do you sit and talk to somebody about themselves for for an hour right you never we never get to have those conversations anymore because people are busy or they don't want to get into something that's controversial and have that weird you know social moment and all that kind of stuff so i really appreciated just getting to know people because people can be pretty fascinating and they have a lot to share uh and that's another great thing about the podcast is that is that more people get to share what they know and what they've learned and i think that that can only be a, a good resource for for people moving forward I think the degree of passion that people exhibited for what they were doing and dedication uh, yeah, was that's beyond been really anything. Great. I I, we've never had one guessed. that we walked out of here and said that didn't work, or we can't, you know, we're not going down that path or whatever. It's they've they've all been positive. I mean, I think we've had good experiences across the board. Yeah, people are huge repositories of of information and ideas and uh, and passions and that sort of stuff, and it, it's it's fun to 
to explore that a little bit. I find myself thinking every now and then, oh, I wish so-and-so were still alive. <laughs> what, a, what a podcast that would make. Sure. You know, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Do you have something, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, once, twice. Well, uh, you know, thank you all for uh, for being part of this project and giving me the opportunity. It's uh, it's been a real pleasure to to work with you all, and you know, we can all stay in touch for sure. And I'll, like I said, I'll be looking forward to to listening in the future. So yeah, and thanks, yeah. Everybody. and thanks for making this happen because yes, it really much. it really has been great. It's been great to be involved. <laughs> Absolutely, and, uh, I'm glad you yes. I'm glad you pushed. <laughs> yeah, I, re- I remember Scott at the beginning yes. saying, "Well, maybe <laughs> I can I do one." Or two. <laughs> And there he comes back again. It comes back again. This is not too yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah, no, this is all right. I could do this. Yeah. And we just wish you all the best. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much. All the best. If you have any questions or comments you would like to share, check out our website at ksu.edu backslash research backslash global food and drop us an email. Our music was adapted from Wayne Goins' album, Chronicles of Carmela. Special thanks to him for providing that to us. Something to Chew On is produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University.